We do this by three things. One, we have a free online speaker directory highlighting the talents of dynamic and expert women speakers from all sorts of domains and all regions and countries. The second thing we do is we recognize and celebrate the accomplishments of these women thought leaders and speakers. And the third thing we do is we develop the potential women speakers of the next generation. We recognize not everybody wakes up in the morning ready to give a keynote speech like some of the ladies you see today, but it could be you next year. So that's why we have a training program to make sure you're ready for it. Dana and I started discussing how can we honor the voices of iconic women from history who changed the world and celebrate the fact that many of the privileges we enjoy today were brought about by these brave women who sacrificed life and liberty to bring these changes. Dana represents speaking while female. Living while female is still very difficult for many women around the world. Right to education, right to work, right to travel within the country or outside, right to participate in the workforce, right to participate in the government, reproductive rights, right to speak, have you heard of Momoko Nojo, the 22-year-old young woman who brought a revolutionary change in Japan just last month? Yoshiro Moto, the former Prime Minister of Japan, had decreed women who participate in boards in important organizations should keep quiet because they tend to speak too much and are too emotional. So Momoko Nojo decided to run a viral online campaign and she brought about his resignation and for the first time in Japanese history, a woman minister leading the Olympic Committee. Women speak up and they change the world. I hope you'll join us today and enjoy the amazing talents of our current women speakers, honoring the voices of historic women and their speeches that brought about many of these changes. We want to take a moment to reflect that what we're enjoying today is the fruit of labors of all of these women. We have a long way to go, but women have always chosen the challenge. Okay, hi. Thank you, Kamudi. That was really inspiring. I was very inspired by that. Um, I want to add my welcome to everybody and extend a warm hello uh, to all of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. I am in the East Coast of the United States, uh, but we have people here today from India, Singapore, Australia, California, Israel, the Philippines, Germany, Sweden, and of course, all of you in the audience are from other places. Um, and I want you to know that this is a historic event. This has never been done before. We've never had a live broadcast in which women from all over the world are coming together to read speeches and honor the words of our foremothers, our uh, women who came before us. So let me share with you a few quick words about Speaking While Female, the organization that I started. Um, I founded the Speaking While Female Speech Bank. It's the world's largest collection of speeches by women. So here's the story. I've been a speechwriter for years. And a few years ago, I got really frustrated because I started to notice that in the world of oratory and public speech, there are so few women's speeches that are recognized. Um, we hear all the time, uh, Winston Churchill quoted and Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy and Gandhi, but we don't hear women's speeches mentioned or quoted. Women's speeches are not in the history book. And you know, a speech is never just a speech. A speech is an act, a speech is um, an expression of creativity. It's an expression of women's thinking and expertise and intellectual firepower. So when women's speeches and women's voices are not in the history books, we're missing out on all of that. Women's agency in history. They're missing as creative beings, as agents of change, and they're missing as role models for our children and our children's children for next generations. I'll give you just a couple quick examples. I started looking through the speech books and I saw famous American speeches, no speeches by women world's greatest speeches. Just a handful of speeches by women. This one is the most famous one in the United States anyway. Lend me your ears, 230 speeches, 15 by women. So 
where are all the women? Where are all the women's voices? I got angry, right? And then I got going. And when I got going, um, I, what I mean is I started collecting women's speeches and putting them all in the speech bank, the Speaking Wall Female Speech Bank, because I wanted to make sure that these speeches were all collected and preserved for, um, for the future. So I looked through um, old newspapers, old archives, old out of print books and started putting the speeches on the site and then doing what I could to make sure that everybody knows about it. And this event is a big part of that. So I'm really, really happy that you're all here with me today to celebrate the history of women's voice and women's participation in the public square, in the marketplace of ideas. It's been going on for centuries and the history books are a little slow to catch up with it, but we are here tonight and to my tonight, you're today and all over the world to change that. So welcome, I'm so happy to see you all. And I look really looking forward to hearing all these wonderful speeches. Thank you, Dana. So that was Dana Rubin, uh, founder of Speaking While Female. So now I'm going to talk, walk, so th this is how it's going to work, okay? So I'm on the first half of the session, we're splitting it into two halves. I'll take you through a journey through time from 19, 1792 France to 1969 India. We'll explore some common themes that pop up worldwide across centuries on women's rights. Then we'll have about a five minute break where you can stretch your legs, go to the loo, uh, or we'll go into various breakout rooms. So you'll meet some fellow audience members or some of the speakers and tell them how fabulous they are uh, for five minutes. And then we'll come back here for our second, se second half uh, where we will walk through about the 100 year old journey of women's suffrage movement that passed through continents like the domino over the short period of time, short period of time from um, down under New Zealand, Australia to um, the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, so let's get started. Our story begins during the time of the French Revolution. Here we meet a key figure by the name of Théroni de Mericourt. Théroni de Mericourt was a Belgian singer, a performer and speaker. She fearlessly expressed ideas that were radical and extremely dangerous. She talked passionately about the ideals of the revolution and the rights of women. For this, she was imprisoned, mocked and chastised by the press. She went to jail for being an agent provocateur. It's a fancy name for a troublemaker. Despite all this, she stuck to her beliefs which you can hear in the following speech. Everyone, let's hear from Anne Caron reading Theroni de Mericourt's This is Our Right. Thank you. Française, armons-nous. Let's arm ourselves. This is our right by nature and even by the law. Let us show men that we are not inferior to them, either in virtues or in courage. Let us show Europe that French women know their rights and are capable of rising to the heights of illuminists of the 18th century. Fellow French women, now that the spread of enlightenment calls upon you to reflect, compare what we are in the social order with what we should be. In order to know our rights and duties, we must take reason as our arbiter. And guided by her, we shall distinguish the just from the unjust. And what consideration right. might then hold us back? Française, je vous le répète encore. Élevons-nous à la hauteur de nos destinées et brisons nos fers. I keep from forgetting to unmute myself. That was amazing. Guys, this is how you can show your love uh, other than just doing the hand wave. Uh, on the chat, just tell our speakers like how fabulous they are so that they can get a cup. They can see how much you appreciated their delivery. So everyone, that was Anne Caron. Anne Caron is a former HR exec at Google, turned people strategy consultant and author of the book, From Zero to 1000, The Organizational Playbook for Startups. So Anne, how was this for you? Uh, actually, I feel a little bit emotional. I'm shaking a bit. <laughs> I think I really embodied um, the Royne de Miricourt. Um, 
I feel so very honored. Um, being French myself, of course, as a kid, I learned about the French Revolution and I haven't heard about Tiawang in the history books. Um, so very honored, very happy that we have the chance to give those women light and that we have also, we're giving the opportunity, um, you know, for our kids to see a truer version or something closer to the truth uh, in terms of history both our daughters and our sons. Okay. So yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Feeling well, great. Thank great. you, Anne. That was a magnificent performance. So on to our next performance. Uh, so after the French Revolution, France was a mess. We meet Louis Michel, a French anarchist and critical member of the Paris Commune. They were pretty much only in power for about two months in France. She was a brilliant teacher who traveled and lectured on the revolutionary themes and women's rights all over France. She challenged her comrades to play a part in the struggle for women's rights after men and women have won the rights of all humanity. And in 1871, she was charged with trying to overthrow the government and put on trial. Her fiery remarks at that trial have gone down in history as you'll hear today. Everyone, let's Singapore. hear it for Uma Rodchia Oratory on Louise Michel's If You Are Not Cowards, Kill Me. I belong completely to the social revolution. I declare that I accept responsibility for all my actions. I accept it entirely and without reservation. You accuse me of having participated in the assassination of Generals Clement Omar and Leconte. To that charge, I would answer yes. If I had been at Momart when those generals wanted to fire on the people, I would have had no hesitation about shooting people who gave orders like that. But but once they were prisoners, I do not understand why they were shot. And I look at that act as a villainous one. As for the burning of Perry, yes, I participated in it. I had no accomplices. I acted on my own. So yes, I must, I must be cut off from society. You have been told that and the prosecutor is right. Since it seems that any heart which beats for liberty has the right only to a small lump of lead, I demand my share. I've finished. So if you're not cowards, kill me. Awesome, that was such a great, uh, love your background too, and the costume. Thank you, Uma. So everyone, um, Uma Rudchia is an award-winning executive creative director and co-founder of the boutique advertising agency, Cover. Uma is renowned as a notorious rule breaker who would dare defy the norm to do what is right. So from one anarchist to another. Uma, how was this for you? It was really powerful. I mean, it really got me. Honestly, I did not know about this woman until I started, you know, had to do a speech. And then I went to read up on her life so that I could project it, I could understand her. And then I realized, here's another notorious rule breaker. You know, she's one of those women, women that I aspire to be like. When I was 16, and I was telling the, you this, right? When I was 16, I came back late, uh, way past my curfew and my dad grounded me and I told him listen I did something good that's why I was late I was helping somebody and he said that's fine if you believe that in helping that helping that person was worth it you should be willing to pay the price for it so you should be willing to be grounded I believe that you shouldn't be late and so I'm going to ground you irrespective and I think that's the thing about having a stand and believing in something as women we it, it's easy to believe in something or stand up for something when it's convenient, but when it's going to cost you your life, it's going to cost you your reputation, it's going, going to cost you everything, if it's the right thing to do. I mean, to me, I always believe in standing up for what is right, irrespective of what it costs me, because whatever happens, it's not going to cost me my conscience and my ability to sleep peacefully at night, knowing I did what I believe in. And to me, this speech was all about that, standing up for what you believe in 
at whatever cost. Wow. Thank you, Uma. That was such amazing passion. I can definitely feel it in your delivery. So, uh, and yes, we. it's amazing to hear this from women from like two centuries ago about how they fought, they, they stood for what they believed in. They spoke their truth. So now that we've heard about what happened in France, let's go across the pond in the United States where there were some women who decided to form a club. Alice Carey is an accomplished and well-known poet in the United States. She was the first president of the Psoriasis Club, the first women's club in the US for women by women. It all started because Charles Dickens came to speak at an event in New York, in New York at, hosted by the New York Press Club, except no women were invited, not even the female journalists. In outrage, women decided to start a club and caused a women's club movement across the country. Alice Carey gave this speech at the Psoriasis Club. Here is Caroline Givener reading what do women want of a club by Alice Carey? If we could have foreseen the sneers and sarcasms which we have been met, they of themselves would have constituted all sufficient reasons for the establishment of this women's club. As it is, they have established a strong impulse towards its continuance and final perpetuity. But ladies, the sneers and sarcasms are after all, but so many acknowledgements of our power and should and will stimulate us to braver assertion, to more persistent effort towards throughout and harmonious organization. And concert and harmony are all that we need to make this enterprise ultimately a great power for good. Indeed, with such women as have already enrolled their names on our list, I, for my part, cannot believe failure possible. Okay, thank you, Carolina. So that was Carolina Givener. Carolina is a leadership keynote speaker who empowers leaders to thrive. She's the knowledge partner of the Women's Leaders Institute. So Carolina, how was this for you? I also got the goosebumps when I found the speech because it resonates with me on a deeper level. These women stood up for their ability to learn, for the privilege to learn, and they recognized that the schools has been open to women only recently. And from the story of Alice, I know that she actually and her sister um, they had to do the day's work on a farm be before they could do any learning. And sometimes their stepmother didn't really appreciate their willingness to learn and commitment to growth. And she denied them the candles so they couldn't have a light. And they were so committed. And from the Alice story, I got so empowered because she said uh, in her story later in her speech, that um, she would like to gather women to share knowledge and wisdom. And this is for the power of everyone, not only, only our own gender. And this was super powerful. I really resonated with her and it really impacted me on emotional level. And it gave me this empowerment going forward because she opened so many doors for us. So thank you, Alice. Thank you everyone for listening. And it was such an honor to present her speech. Well, thank you, Carolina. And yes, it is beautiful to see women helping women, uh, even at the start of like 100, over 100 years ago. Now, now we've heard, seen what it was like in the West. Now, what, what's happening in the East? Well, here is someone who's straddled both worlds to fight for women's rights about 30 years later. Mabel Ping Hua Li was born in China, but grew up in the United States. She was the first woman to earn a PhD in economics in the United States from Colombia. As a student, she was active in fighting for women's vote and voting and during, so at voting in the US. Using her economics degree, Lee wanted to be part of the new generation of workers to help China's people. But on her third trip to China, she changed her mind. 
family obligations, the racial and sexist discrimination in the Sino-Japanese war started to make it unsafe for her to be in China. But she never gave up on her desire to help Chinese women. And in this speech she gave in 1915 reflects that. Everyone, let's hear it from Abel Wanamakok uh, on Mabel Pinghua's Lee's China's Submerged Half. I plea for a wider sphere of usefulness for the long submerged women of China. I ask for our girls, the open door to the treasure of knowledge, the same opportunities for physical development as boys, and the same rights to participate in all human activities of which they're individually capable. A new day has dawned, tempered by crampling foot bandages and the ever more rigid bonds of our old social customs, our women have known no horizon beyond the four walls of our houses. They have received so little education, if any at all, that even in thought, they have been practically limited to the areas within these walls. That they, in spite of these limitations, have exercised such undeniable influence from time to time. Not only laws must be passed in the interest of the future mothers of the new republic, but they must be religiously enforced, prejudice, must be removed and a healthy public sentiment created to support the progressive movement. Thank you, Abel. What a speech, such passion. So Abel, Abel is the founder of Find Your Voice Asia, an award-winning coaching service based in Thailand that, for, that focuses on public speaking, holistic and transformational techniques to help you find your voice. Abel, how was this speech for you? Um, it's very personal in a way because she speaks with such power and her words mean so much. And I wish I can say more um, from you know, her, her, her speech. Thanks to Donna for finding this speech. But as an Asian woman, a Chinese American woman also, same as Mabel, and my name is Abel, it's so close. Um, I feel such a connection with her. And you know, it doesn't even matter whether we think we are restricted or not is what we need to voice out and we need to educate because just to be fair, men are used to getting what they want. It's not that they want to restrict us, but they're used to receiving it. And when we easily give what they expect, they will continue to expect. So we have to voice our needs, our desires to you know our better half or to our colleagues and to let them know what it is that we need that let us live a fulfilling life. And of course, we do not have foot bandages like back then where women cannot even walk um, and we're not confined to our four walls anymore. Some women um, choose to be confined because that's what they enjoy. And some people feel still that their main role is to be mothers and child bearers. And I can tell you, you can push, you can do more and you can always um, you know, be able to do more than what you think you can do. So never stop at just now and always try to expand and grow yourself. So I, I love her speech. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I really, really enjoying this. Thank you. Well, thank thank you, you Abel. Like, I think like you guys are all setting great role models for my uh, eight-year-old niece who's watching us. Uh, okay, so now that we've heard about, so now at around the same time, someone else is making waves in Egypt. Huda Shaawi was an Egyptian feminist who defied the norms and, and rules to speak up for women's rights. She was born into a well-known family and educated at a young age. She experienced firsthand the challenges of a patriarchal society because at 13, she married her cousin. And at that same time, women in Egypt had two choices, house or harem. Shawi resented the restrictions on women's movements and began, began organizing lectures for women. After her husband's death, she decided to stop wearing her veil in public. And in 1923, she and her companions deliberately pulled off their veils in front of a crowd and at the train station. It was an electrifying gesture in women's history in Egypt. Shawi delivered this speech at the first Arab feminist conference. She stressed, that there is no incompatibility between Islam and modern feminism. Everyone, let's hear it from Yasmin Kather on Huda Shawi's 
Arab Feminist Conference speech. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arab woman who is equal to men in duties and obligations will not accept that in the 20th century, the distinction between the sexes that the advanced countries have done away with. The Arab woman will not agree to be chained to slavery and to pay the consequences of men's mistakes with respect to her country and the future of her children. The woman demand her political rights restored rights granted to her by the Sharia. The advanced nation has come to believe in the quality of sexes, even though their religious and secular laws have not even reached the levels Islam has reached in terms of justice towards women. Islam has given her the right to vote, to vote for the ruler and has allowed her to give opinions on questions on jurisprudence and religion. The woman given by creator the right to vote for her successor of the prophet is deprived the right to vote. The Sharia has given her the right to education, to take part of hijara and to fight on the ranks of warriors and has made her equal to men in all rights and responsibilities, even in the crime that either sex can commit. However, the man who alone distributes rights has kept the rights to legislate and rule. And I do believe that the Arab man would be a various and not give women back her lawful rights. Thank you, Yasmin. That was such a powerful delivery. How was this for you? It was very emotional because um, I'm Muslim and I always people think that like Islam treats women badly because of what's perceived in the, in the media. But if you look at actually like laws and you look at historically, when Islam came about, Islam gave women the most amount of rights that any other religion had ever given. So having her like just share the case just as it is, just that, that's what it is, um, was just like, wow, like that's pretty badass. Well, thank you, Yasmin. So that was Yasmin Kater, an adventurer, storyteller, podcast host, and producer of Asia's first documentary series around climate change. Now, before we go on a break, we still have one more speech. Let's hear it, what's happening still in Asia. Um, Indira, uh, let's go to India. Indira Gandhi was the first and only female prime minister of India. She served three terms and, well, was assassinated on the fourth. She was a powerful role model who shaped much of modern India and left a long record of growth, modernization, and accomplishment. Indira Gandhi once said to a friend, I am in no sense a feminist, but I believe in women being able to do everything. She used her visibility and authority to express enduring human values. And she gave this speech in 1969 at a tribute to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. during his widow's visit to India. MLK was assassinated a few months earlier. Here's Pallavi Trivat Shivastava on Indira Gandhi's tribute to MLK. This award, madam, is the highest tribute our nation can bestow on the work for understanding and brotherhood among men. It is named after Mahatma Gandhi, who himself was a peacemaker and who all his life labored passionately for peace, justice, and freedom, not only in India, but throughout the world. Dr. Martin Luther King's struggle was for these same values. He paid for his ideals with his blood, forging a new bond among the brave and the conscientious of all races and all nations. Dr. King's dream embraced the poor and the oppressed of all lands. He spoke of the right of humans to survive and recognized three threats to our survival, racial injustice, poverty, and war. While there is bondage anywhere, we ourselves cannot be fully free. While there is oppression anywhere, we ourselves cannot soar high. Martin Luther King was convinced that one day, the misguided people who believed in racial superiority would realize the error of their ways. Let us not rest until the equality of all races and all religions becomes a living fact. Thank you, Pallavi. That was very moving. So Pallavi is the APAC talent leader for IBM Global Technology Services. She is 
passionate about amplifying diverse voices of change and is the DNI champion within her organization. Pallavi, how was this for you? Yeah, this was uh, this was a very poignant speech because uh, it actually brings uh, brings together three uh, you know heroes of diversity and inclusion. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi was known for nonviolence, uh, his nonviolent struggle. Of course, he's the father of our nation. Indira Gandhi was a prime minister, and she became the first female prime minister more than thirty five years ago. Uh, you know, which uh, it, it's something that we are always very proud of. Uh, and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, today when we are still struggling with so much of inequity, so much of exclusion, uh, and you know, we, we have movements uh, like the Black Lives Matter, which is still, uh, you know, it's still there. I think this speech is still very, very relevant. So it spoke to me because of course, I'm very proud of the legacies of Mahatma Gandhi and Indira Gandhi uh, being from the same country. Uh, but it also, as I said, it's very relevant uh, voice even today. Uh, and that's what that's what the speech uh, spoke to me. Well, well, thank you, Pallavi. That was beautiful. So guys, um, we are halfway through. We're going to go on a quick five minute break. Uh, so our five minute break is we're going to send you guys into breakout rooms. So who knows, you might be lucky enough, you get to be in the room with one of those, uh, one of our female speakers, uh, you'll tell you can tell who they are based on the asterisk before their name. Uh, but if you also want to go to the loo, uh, bathroom, stretch your legs, grab a drink, you're also welcome to. Uh, so if you don't want to be in a breakout room with someone, just um, you can just click the breakout room and join us here in the main sessions, okay? So Christian is going to assign us randomly into breakout room. So consider it as your virtual blind date. I'll see you guys in five minutes, okay? Hi everyone, welcome back. And I hope you guys were able to at least grab a break, uh, had a good break, grab, grab, grab that drink of yours. So. Before the break, we, we kind of like hopped around history over, for 230 years. Now this time, I will walk you through about the 30 years of the 30 years, probably like the climactic event around the women's suffrage movement in the West. Uh, we head down first into New Zealand in 1889 to meet the woman who started the trend. Kate Shepard was the was the most prominent member of the women's suffrage movement in New Zealand. She was an active temperance campaigner working to outlaw the consumption of alcohol, the, working, to, uh, working to outlaw the consumption of alcohol. The temperance cause and the fight for women's vote went hand in hand because so many men would abuse alcohol and then in turn abuse or abandon their wives and children. She created a petition for the woman's vote with 30,000 names from all over New Zealand. The petition went to parliament and in 1893, New Zealand became the first country in the world to make women voting universal. Fun fact, Kate Shepard made riding a bicycle acceptable for women. So Kate had this radical vision of what women can achieve as you'll hear from Nimisha Taylor reading Kate Shepard's Take the Matter Up. When we were told that the franchise would make woman unwomanly, that she would neglect her home duties on account of it, that it would cause dissension between husband and wife, and that because she cannot fight, she should not vote. When we hear of these objections, we feel somehow as if that way of thinking had gone out of date a long time ago. Unfortunately, however, there are still many who still have very little thought on the subject. And it is for us who have the earnest desire to take part in the social and political reforms that are so much needed to influence those that are indifferent or antagonistic and to point out the shallowness of the objections raised. Women themselves must take the matter up. We must feel sure of our ground and bring all our enthusiasm and personal influence to bear and break down the barriers that stand between them and their rightful privileges. 
Thank you, Nimisha. So Nimisha Taylor is a competition and regulation specialist. She shares how governments and businesses can boost productivity and innovation by making markets competitive in the digital economy. So Nimisha, how was this for you? Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share this speech. I had so much uh, fun learning it. This was very powerful for me because obviously Kate was one of the first to lead um, in New Zealand and she wanted to really make a difference uh, on government policy. And that resonates very much with me because I've worked in government in New Zealand, in the UK and in Singapore. And I've also had the opportunity to have that influence. Um, I also want to uh, think it's actually fantastic that Kate is actually celebrated uh, and recognized uh, in New Zealand and actually appears on a Kiwi $10 note. Um, so I guess she probably resonates with me every time I am spending with these. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Oh, wow. Love it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nimisha. So now following the success, in New Zealand, we head to Australia to meet another trailblazer. Louisa Lawson was an Australian writer, publisher, and lifelong campaigner for women's rights. She published America's first journal produced solely by women called The Dawn. The Dawn covered women's right to vote, women's education, economic and legal rights, and domestic violence. She also founded The Dawn Club in Sydney, which was the focal point of the suffrage movement. In the following speech, oh, so when the New South Wales Womanhood Suffrage Bill passed in 1902, Lawson was named the mother of suffrage in New South Wales. In the following speech, you'll hear Lawson's mix of anger at the way things were and hope for a better future. Everyone, let's hear it for Simone de Haas on Louisa Lawson's presage of a better future. The popular idea of an advocate of women's rights is this. She is an angular, hard-featured, withered creature with a shrill, harsh voice, spectacles on nose, and the repulsive title, blue stocking, visible all over her. The whole principle of the justice of the women's vote agitation may be compressed into a question. Who ordained that men only should make the laws to which both men and women have to conform? Pray, why should one half of the world govern the other half? Facts against theories show nothing to a woman's disadvantage. They are, I am glad to say, a happy presage to a better future. 25 years ago, women with insignificant exceptions could not vote anywhere. Last January, 2 million women voted in England, Scotland and Wales at the election of county councils. They only need one step more, while we are far behind. It remains for the women of Australia to say how long they will lag in the rear of the great onward march of liberal thought and women's advance. We have examples. Now we only need our own efforts. Wow. I could practically see her coming to life in your, uh, in your reading. Thank you, Simone. So Simone de Haas, is a masterful communicator, coach, and mentor. Her unique and diverse portfolio creates a strong platform for developing transformational leaders and building exceptional organizations. So Simone, how was this for you? I was actually nervous. I think one of the things, like, when you step into these incredibly powerful women's shoes, um, you do, you take on kind of like a mantle um, of, doing justice to their voice. I think you, you need to uh, pay tribute to the road that, that, that they have paved for you. Um, and what I particularly liked about the opening of this speech and the idea just came to me early on to, to play with that character a little was that how much she actually addressed the issue of that unconscious bias that I believe is still around today, that if you are an advocate of women's rights, you are somehow unwomanly. 
And so I thought that that was such a powerful message for us, for all of us as advocates of women's rights, as keynote speakers, as women who want to change the world through the power of our voice. And I thought it was a very telling moment in her speech where she challenges us all to really pay attention to our attitude. So it really landed home for me. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you for bringing it home too. That was a masterful delivery. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. So now on the other side of the world, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, someone else was uh, creating a tidal wave. Emmeline Pankhurst was a British political activist. She organized the UK suffrage movement and helped women win the vote. In 1903, she founded an organization, WSPU, that used militant tactics to fight for women's vote. The suffragettes smash windows in stores and prominent buildings, drop bombs and set fire to post boxes and unoccupied buildings. Not very ladylike and very uh, violent. The motto, the motto of WSPU was deeds, not words. She was a woman of action. As a speaker, Emmeline Pankhurst's speeches were electrifying she refused to be silent. She spoke everywhere, including her own trial. In 1913, while in the US, she made the speech that was considered to be her best, Freedom or Death, where she compares fighting for British women's rights to America's battle for independence. Everyone, here's Gail Gibson on Emmeline Pankhurst's Freedom or Death. Ladies and gentlemen, Many people come to Hartford to address meetings as advocates of some reform. Tonight is not to advocate a reform that I address a meeting in Hartford. I do not come here as an advocate because whatever the position the suffrage movement may occupy in the United States, in England, it has passed the realm of advocacy and it has entered into the sphere of practical politics. It has become the subject of revolution and civil war. And so tonight, I am not here to advocate women's suffrage. American suffragists can do that well for themselves. I am here as a soldier who has temporarily left the field of battle in order to explain, it seems strange, it should have to be explained, what civil war is like when civil war is waged by women. They have said to us, government, they have said to us, government rests upon force and women haven't force, so they must submit. Well, we are not showing them that government does not rest upon force at all. It rests upon consent. As long as women consent to be unjustly governed, they can be but directly women say, we withhold our consent. We will not be governed any longer so long as that government is unjust. Not by the forces of civil war can you govern the very weakest woman. You can kill that woman, but she escapes you then. You cannot govern her. And that is, I think, the most valuable demonstration we have been making to the world. We have been proving in our own person that government does not rest upon force, it rests upon consent. As long as people consent to government, it is perfectly easy to govern, but directly they refuse, then no power on earth can govern a human being, however feeble, who withholds his or her consent. And all of the strange happenings that you have read about over here have been manifestations of a refusal to consent on the part of the woman. They know little what women are. Women are very slow to rouse, but once they are aroused, once they are determined, nothing on earth and nothing in heaven will make women give way. It is impossible. You won your freedom in America when you had the revolution by bloodshed, by sacrificing human life. You won the civil war by the sacrifice of human life when you decided to emancipate the Negro. You have left it to women in your land. The men of all civilized countries have left it to women to work out their own salvation. 
that is the way in which we women of England are doing. Human life for us is sacred, but we say if any life is to be sacrificed, it shall be ours. We won't do it ourselves, but we will put the enemy in the position where they will have to choose between giving us freedom or giving us death. Thank you, Gail. So that was Gail. Thank you, Gail, for that delivery. Like it was uh, very moving. Um, Gail Gibson is an executive coach, author, and speaker from Perth, Australia. She's the founder of Geisha Consultancy. So Gail, how was this for you? You know, deeply honored to be chosen such a powerful and such an iconic woman who has everyone in the world, I think, knows about Emmeline Pankhurst. Um, very nervous to run that speech as well, but at the same time, it just, the more that I read it, the more that it built that momentum. It's such a powerful, you know, it resonates so strongly with me. I'm known as the can-do coach, and that to me is what is the person that Emmeline Pankhurst was, someone who stood up and said, you know, we can do this, we can, with the support of the uh, New Zealand suffragettes and the Australian suffragettes who really led the way. Um, unfortunately, the UK came that little bit later and she didn't live to see the, the right to vote happen in um, the UK. So it was, as it was said to me, one of the most rousing speeches ever. It really, um, it, it really lifted me and it is such a powerful message that she said, we can do this together. And we are, as women across the world, we're getting stronger and we are finding our voice and we are sharing that voice. And thank you so much for the privilege to do this today. Well, well thank you, Gail, for that delivery. So. So as women are slowly starting to win their rights to vote, let's go to North Carolina, United States, and we meet Annie Julia Cooper. Annie Julia Cooper was an American author, educator, sociologist, Black liberation activist, and one of the most prominent African American scholars in the United States history. Despite being born into slavery in North Carolina, she received a world-class education and became prominent in the academic circles, especially in sociology. She lived in a time when women, especially women of color, had to fight to get access to education. This was the time when racial lines were drawn. The women's suffrage movement and the women's group were not welcoming to black women. She was part of the group that formed the Colored Women's League. She is the mother of Black feminism. She delivered this speech in Congress in 1892, and you can hear the mix of anger at the way things were and the hope for a better future. Dana Rubin on Anna Julia Cooper's Women's Rights Are One and Universal. I think if I could crystallize the sentiment of my constituency and deliver it as a message to this Congress of women, it would be something like this. Let woman's claim be as broad in the concrete as in the abstract. We take our stand on the solidarity of humanity, the oneness of life and the unnaturalness and injustice of all special favoritisms, whether of sex, race, country, or condition. If one link of the chain be broken, the chain is broken. A bridge is no stronger than its weakest part and a cause is not worthier than its weakest element. Least of all, can women's cause afford to decry the weak. We want then as toilers for the universal triumph of justice and human rights to go to our homes from this Congress demanding an entrance, not through a gateway for ourselves, our race, our sex, or our sect, but a grand highway for humanity. The colored woman feels that woman's cause is one and universal. And that not till the image of God, whether in Parian or Ebony, is sacred and inviolable. Not till race, color, sex, and condition are seen as accidents and not the substance of life. Not till the universal title of humanity to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is conceded to be inalienable to all, then, is women's law is women's lesson taught and women's cause won. Not the white woman's, not the black woman's, not the red woman's, but the cause of every man and every woman who has writhed 
silently under a mighty wrong. Women's wrongs are thus indissolubly, indissolubly linked with undefended woe and the acquirements of her rights will mean the final triumph of all right over might, the supremacy of the moral force of reason and justice and love in the government of the nations of earth. Thank you, Dana. So Dana Rubin, thank you. That was such a powerful reading. Dana Rubin is a consultant in New York focusing on women's voice and speech. She's researched the history of women's speech and created the world's largest archive of women's speeches from all over the world, the speeches that we are presenting now. So Dana, how's it so far for you? Oh my gosh, this speech is particularly moving to me because Anna Julia Cooper was a voice for black women, but also as you could hear from this section for all women. She really spoke for all humanity. And in this day when we are so divided, really there's so much disharmony and division, her voice is more needed than ever. And her words are, are really like a balm on so many wounds and so much injury and so much hurt. I feel that her voice is a voice for our time. Okay. Well, thank you, Dana. So from North Carolina, we head down to New York City where all the action happens. Meet Clara Lemlick. Clara Lemlick is a total badass. She migrated to the United States at the age of 17 from Ukraine, where she found work in the garment industry, also known as the sweatshop. She found the hours long, conditions terrible, unsafe, unhealthy, and brutal. As a 23-year-old Ukrainian immigrant, she rose to the position of power in women's labor movement, becoming the voice that incited the famous uprising of the 20,000 in 1909, a prolonged strike that led to better and safer working conditions. Lemlik was also a passionate suffragist, and in 1912, she took part in the mass protest against the U.S. legislators who were opposed to the women getting the vote in New York City. She was a woman impatient for change and held on to a vision for a better future. Better future. Stacy Bernal on Clara Lemlick's We Are Here to Stay. Men tell us that they want to relieve the burdens of women. We have many widows in this great city alone. After a woman loses her husband, do you hear of any man or any group of men or even the state that is supposed to take care of the people coming to the widow and to ask her, what is it you have lost? Just go through any of the public buildings at midnight and you will see old and middle-aged women on their knees, scrubbing away the dirt that men of business have brought in during the day. That gives you a picture of how well men carry the burdens of women. We are told that we have 31,000 women over the age of 65 years who are self-supporting. For the 30,000 prostitutes that we have in New York City alone, you men are responsible. You men as a body who make the laws and men of money who support the makers of the laws are responsible for this system of ours that forces 30,000 girls into the streets. How would the Senator help the women? He cannot help us. We have to toil and we want a chance to make better laws under which we are to live. Oh, wow. Well, that was amazing. Well, from one badass to another. Um, that's Stacy Bernal, everyone. Uh, so Stacy Bernal is the author, speaker, and coach. She works with organizations that want to cultivate their team members' inner badassery to feel empowered to share their voices and ideas to create lasting change. So Stacy, how was this for you? This was wonderful. And this whole event, learning about all of these badass, powerful women, because I think, you know, often we, we do take certain things for granted. We, we take certain rights for granted and we forget the fights that had to happen in order for, for us to be where we are today. And knowing that we still have quite a lot of fighting left to go. So it, this has been so inspiring and um, being here with all of these other amazing women all over the world. I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Well, 
Thank you. Uh, that was brilliant. Like show some love in the chat. And yes, uh, it's it's been an amazing journey so far. Like we've gone through like about 10 speakers, 10 speeches already, and we still have a few more. Uh, I get goosebumps just like seeing these women's voices come back to life from our amazing speakers. So now that we've met New York's badass, here comes Superwoman. Anna Howard Shaw was known for her passion for speaking up on women's suffrage movement in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. She's a medical doctor, an ordained minister, and the National, Women, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association president. Talk about Superwoman. During her presidency, she leveraged her power and position and used public speaking as a political strategy. She delivered the following speech during one of the many political conventions she attended. Here's Mette Johansson, another superwoman, reading an excerpt from Anna Howard Shaw's Hysterical and Emotional. By some objectors, women are supposed to be unfit to vote because they are hysterical and emotional. And of course, men do not want any emotions to enter into a political campaign. I had heard so much about our emotionalism that I went to the last Democratic National Convention held at Baltimore to observe the calm propose of our male politicians. I saw some men carry a picture of the gentleman whom they wanted elected. Behind them followed hundreds of men who were shouting, yelling, screaming. They were jumping on their seats. They were throwing their hats up into the air and shouting, what's the matter with Champ Clark? And when the hats came flying down again, others would kick them back into the air and they would say, he's all right. And then I heard others scream, Underwood, Underwood first, last and every time. No hysteria about it, just patriotic loyalty and splendid manly devotion to principle. Wow, Mette, I did not know you got that one. What a, what a performance. Uh, that was Mette Johansson. Mette is a multi-awarded social entrepreneur and the CEO of MetaMind Training. She's a learning and development consultant for multinationals, blue chip companies, as well as an international speaker and best-selling author. I told you guys, superwoman. So Mete, how was this for you? Oh, it was fun. I love the irony in all of this and I just wanted to live it completely out. So it was absolutely fantastic. And also thinking about it, I had a conversation that was very similar just last week with a chief human resource officer, she said that in her company, men think that women are not fit for leadership because they are too emotional. <laughs> That's exactly what she said. And then she said afterwards, and look at the board meetings, look at the men, slam their fist on the desk and shout and losing their patience. So it is so relevant today. This speech was held over a hundred years ago and it's still so relevant today. So yeah, that was my takeaway from this. Awesome. Well, thank you, Meta. That was a great, great delivery. Uh, I can just like see from the audience, it's like they they were having a blast. So after this speech, then World War One happened, and after but and after the First World War, women continued on to their campaign. We meet. We go back to New York, and we meet Crystal Eastman. Crystal Eastman was a brilliant lawyer and suffragist. She graduated second in law school in 1907, but had difficulty finding legal work because law firms don't hire women lawyers. She took part in a prestigious research project that led to the first workers' compensation law in the US, protecting workers who were injured on the job. After World War I, Eastman organized the first feminine Congress in 1919. She delivered this speech in 1920, immediately after women Got, secured the vote in the US. It only took them 70 years to make this happen. Now, Eastman had her eyes fixed on the future. She envisions what issues women will grapple now that they had the right to vote. Here's Valerie Chow on Crystal Eastman's Now We Can Begin. 
most women will agree 23rd August 1920, when the Federal Suffrage Amendment is enacted, is the day to begin, not the day to end it. Men are perhaps saying, thank God, this everlasting woman fight is over. But women, if I know them, are saying, now, at last, we can begin. The average man has carefully cultivated an ignorance about household matters. As a boy, he was quick to see how no good around the house would make him good throughout his life, and half-consciously began to cultivate this uh, unconsciousness until today to the despair of feminist wives. How can we change the nature of men so can, he can honorably share that work and responsibility, and thus make homemaking enterprise a song instead of a burden? Most actually not by laws, but perhaps we must cultivate a little of the helplessness ourselves. But fundamentally, it is a problem of education, of early training. We must bring up feminist sons. Thank you, Valerie. Thank um, you. <laughs> no, thank you, Valerie, for that delivery. Such an emotion. So Valerie Cho is a versatile 360 marketer with integrated marketing experience from the retail consumer industry to the financial services industry. So Valerie, how was this for you? Uh, it's pretty emotional because I relate very well with the story. As a young girl from a Chinese household and the only daughter I was growing up, and I was always the one tasked to do the household helping my mother while my brother got away scot free. So that was past the era. And I believe it's not just raising family, sons and educating men, but it's so honest on us women to put a stop to this, to say that, yeah, you know, we are not always the first one to go ahead and we do all the household matters. The guys, the men have to come in and play a part and support. And we play hand in hand. We have moved into the workforce. It's time they play a bigger role and all that. So there's inclusion and um, balance for both parties. All right. Well, thank you, Valerie. So what a journey it was for women to get their right to vote. So now that we've looked at, now that we've, the women had the right to vote, now let's look at the women's right to hold office. We go back to Australia. Dame Enid Lyons was an Australian politician. She was the first woman elected in, into the Australian House of Representatives and the first woman to serve in the federal cabinet. Her husband, Joseph Lyons, was a wide, widely popular minister. And as his wife, she enjoyed a similar high profile uh, visibility and popularity through her articles, radio broadcasts, and speeches. She had her own voice. Her husband died suddenly of a heart attack in 1939 while still in office. Four years later, Dame Enid won the election to represent the state of Tasmania in parliament. On this historic occasion, Dame Enid became the first woman MP to address the Australian Parliament. This is an excerpt from her speech. Everyone, let's hear it from Joanne Flynn on Dame Enid Lyons' maiden speech. I know that many honorable members have viewed the advent of women into the legislative halls with something approaching alarm. They have feared, I have no doubt, the somewhat too vigorous use of a new broom. I wish to reassure them. I hold very sound views on brooms and sweeping. Although I quite realize that a new broom is a very useful adjunct to the work of the housewife, I also know it is undoubtedly very unpopular in the broom cupboard. I hope that no one will imagine that this implies in any way a limitation of my political interests. Rather, it implies an ever widening outlook on every problem that faces the world today. Every subject from high finance to international relations, from social security to winning the war. These are not problems of statistics, but problems of human values and human hearts and human feelings. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for that delivery. Uh, so, Joanne is the founder of Unicorning. She draws on her extensive business growth experience and her passion for people to enable organizations to bridge the purpose profit gap. So Joanne, how was this for you? Uh, I could feel like the, I could feel her energy and power just 
evidently when she read that speech in parliament, it was considered so, it was so powerful that the men were crying. <gasps> Again, you know, not that they don't have emotions, but in saying it here and now, I can still feel that this, this implicit story that we have, the, I love the fact she brought the broom in and just laid it on the table and brought the family into the parliament as an equal player in the field of choice. And that her vision of who she was going to be was an, a stateswoman. She wasn't, she was not there to be a token. She was there to be a player on the field. And that she did. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joanne. That was a great delivery. Now, now we've heard primarily from women in the political arena, but what about women from other sectors? Women who use their mass media popularity to highlight social issues still relevant today. To close us off, our final speech uh, is from Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker was an American born French entertainer. She was, world, she was a world famous celebrity, an exotic dancer and a movie star. When I think of Josephine Baker, I see the glittering nightclubs of Paris and that infamous banana skirt. She was adored by many, except for in her hometown of St. Louis, where she grew up poor. She performed full-time to support herself and her big break came when she toured Paris and became an overnight sensation. The Parisian audience embraced her as a black female performer. And in 1952, she returned to St. Louis explaining why racism drove her away from the US to Europe where she performed and lived freely as a black woman. Here is Denise Morris Kipnis on Josephine Baker's homecoming day. I remember when Charles Lindbergh arrived in Paris and I was one of the first persons to know about his landing. I forgot that Lindbergh was a white man and might not have liked blacks. I only remember that he was an American and that he had done something great for the progress of the world. The first nonstop flight from New York to Paris. My heart burst with pride. And friends of mine invited me to one of the most fashionable restaurants in Paris at the time, and everyone was drinking to the health of Lindbergh, when all of a sudden a clear and loud voice sounded. A white American couple called the head waiter and told him not to serve me because in America, this is not done. At home, they said a black woman belongs in the kitchen. And this brought a great silence in the restaurants. If the floor could have opened and swallowed me, it would have been a blessing. And the manager reminded them that they were in France where human beings were equal. And if they wanted to leave, they could. Americans, the eyes of the world are upon you. How can you expect the world to respect your preaching of democracy when you yourself treat your colored brothers and sisters as you do? Let us stop saying white Americans and colored Americans. Let us try once and for all saying Americans. Let human beings be equal on earth as in heaven. Oh, wow, Denise, I love it. You even brought in the vibe with like that filter, like one, for, like you brought Josephine Baker to life. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Denise, okay, Denise uh, Morris Kipnis is known for organizational pu puzzle solving and big picture thinking. Denise expertise as this, Denise's expertise centers on whole systems approach to cultural culture change, transformation, inclusion, and simplification. Denise, how was this for you? So honestly, um, I'm, I'm a, a bit distracted these days, you know, and trying to do the whole single mommy thing, run a business, run a full-time job, like it's, it's crazy. So KG found this and it was perfect for me because Josephine Baker is, she, you know, she was naked part of the time. She loved a good cocktail. She was very political and she had a, a chosen home outside the United States. So I really um, 
it could really connect with what's going on. And I think it's very salient for where we are right now. It's, it's not the safest of times for folks that live like me in the United States right now, you know, and thinking about whether or not there's more opportunity abroad. So I think a lot of what she was speaking about then is still very relevant right now. Um, so I smiled thinking about Joe. All right. Well, thank you. You definitely brought her words to life in this moment. So that, like how time flies, right? Like that was like our 15 speeches. Now, um, for people who, if you can't get enough more, we have 14 more later today uh, at 4 p.m. Singapore time. So your ticket can allow you access to get in and watch uh, and watch the second performance that we have. Different speakers, different speeches, and also different hosts. Um, but now before we close off, I would like to call back KG Kamudi Goda to give uh, the closing remarks. Thank you so much, incredible, incredible keynote speakers for bringing to life and honoring the voices of all these amazing women. I was moved to tears, had goosebumps, and just heart beating out of my chest all the time you were all speaking. This effort could not have been possible without the tireless hard work and many, many late nights over the last three months. We began with a vision from Dana Rubin and her organization, Speaking While Female. And then we have an incredibly hardworking team from Keynote Women Speakers Directory. Take a bow, Minoli, from the mini project for the gorgeous artwork that has been stunning and delighting all of our audience for all of these weeks. Evelina Camilleri for your impeccable project management skills. Anna Ong, the peerless moderator who kept you all on the edge of your seats with all her commentary and introductions. Valerie Chow, who's going to be also MC in the next segment. We also have Leslie Cowley, who's our awesome VA. She's the go-to person for all of Keynote. We have Lizette Torres, who helps actively with our social media campaigns. We have Florence Turk, who you'll meet next segment. She was helping us with the project management. She's also a speaker and she's based in Europe. And finally, none of this would have been possible without Meta Johansson, the superwoman who had you rousing and cheering just a few minutes back. Thank you, everybody. If you have amazing women speakers, send us their names. We want them on our directory. If you are not identifying as female and you'd like to support and empower women, be our allies. Mm. We have a page dedicated to allies. If you're an organization <laughs> and you want to signal to the world that you support women and you want to advocate for women's rights, become a corporate sponsor, donor, collaborator, partner. See you soon. Thank you very much.